Good morning. Thank you all for coming this morning. I'm Reena Kashyap, and I'm an INSECA board member. Um, I'd like to introduce um, this, this lecture, um, Chef and Potter. And um, we have right here on the podium Greg Moore, who is uh, Associate uh, Professor of Visual and Performing Arts at Arcadia University. He's a, he is an artist, designer, and educator, and his uh, studio practice explores the relationship between ceramics and agri agricultural cuisine. He's a professor of visual and performing arts and head of ceramics at Arcadia University. Please join me in welcoming Greg Moore. Thanks very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for coming. I'm going to share with you today a collaboration that I'm currently working on with a chef by the name of Dan Barber in New York. And as a brief introduction to um, Dan and his work, um, Dan is a chef, a, uh, an author, and really a, a leading advocate in the farm to table movement um, and beyond. Uh, his restaurant, Blue Hill at Stone Barns, sits on the, um, on the property on the farm of the, Blue, of the Stone Barn Center for Food and Agriculture. This is about 30 minute drive north of New York City. Um, it's a beautiful farm, a lovely restaurant. Um, the farm, the mission of the farm really is to promote progressive agriculture. Um, and the mission of the restaurant which you see in the building um, at the bottom of the hill there. The, the restaurant, Stone, um, Stone Barns, Blue Hill Stone Barns, um, is an old Rockefeller estate, estate um, that uh, a number of years ago started as um, kind of a grand idea to share um, best farming practices. And to highlight those practices, they wanted a restaurant on site to use all the produce, all the animals um, that were produced on the farm and showcase those products. Um, so I was introduced to Dan um, for a little bit more than four years ago when I read his book called Third Plate. And um, it struck me that his practice, his approach to cooking uh, had many parallels to my approach uh, in the studio. I mean, I think we can all pretty easily think of some parallels between cooking and ceramics. We have the oven in the kiln, like bread dough, clay. There are processes in the kitchen that mimic processes in the studio. But really, um, it was his approach to ingredients that I felt um, I had a lot in common with with my approach to materials. And so the parallel between ingredients in the kitchen, materials in my studio, um, generated uh, a proposal that I sent to him um, asking if we could work together. And so pretty quickly we started a relationship where I would um, come and eat and we would talk. I'd make some uh, prototypes, some pieces, for him to play with, and then um, he would use them, see if they worked, see if they didn't work, and then on and on and on. So it's been ongoing for about four years. What you're looking at here on the right, uh, the first piece I'll show you, um, on the right is a, a plate or a bowl that uh, Dan showed me the first time we met, and it was his favorite piece. It's made out of limestone, it's worn out. He had a whole bunch of them at one point. This was the last one. Fragile, didn't make it through the dishwasher very well, but he loved it. And he loved it because it was the perfect canvas for his work. Um, uh, it had a surface that didn't compete with his, with his uh, food. It really showcased it well. So on the left is my take on that piece, and I'll show you quickly. I'm going to try to run through many images and then hopefully leave a little bit of time at the end for questions if you have any of them. So uh, this is that same. Uh, piece but in bowl form. It's black porcelain unglazed. Um, technically, it's kind of a feat. It's thick. Um, it retains heat in incredibly well. So they go into the oven to warm. 
and then at the table they're still quite hot, or they go in the freezer when they serve ice cream or something cold, and at the table they do this really wonderful thing where they frost over. Um, it is durable. It withstands the, um, the kitchen environment, in particular the dishwasher environment, which um, if you know restaurant use can be uh, uh, pretty traumatic for the dishware. Um, and it really needed to be able to um, get plated, go out to the dining room, get used, come back through the dishwasher, get stacked, get plated 10, 20, sometimes 50 times a night. So this became a workhorse for, for the kitchen. Uh, it's really the, the go-to dish for the chefs and the cooks in the kitchen. Because it um, is a really nice canvas for uh, the food that they make. These are beets and onions on crackers. Um, so that eventually it took on the, the name uh, the chef's plate because they all really liked the way it made the food look. Um, this is the bowl with a squash stem bolognese. Ter very functional, really um, quite nice palate. Um, yogurt with edible flowers. Um, so I mentioned heat retention. Uh, it, it holds heat very well. It's obviously very thick as well. Um, and so one of the things Dan talked to me about at one point was trying to bring the outside in. Of course, farm to table is sort of doing that, right? Bringing the outside into the dining room, into the kitchen, uh, but also not just the, uh, the produce or the products, but the processes as well. And so we took advantage of um, the, the heat retention qualities of this material and I started making charcoal out of the black porcelain, which allowed the chefs to um, cook at the table without filling the dining room with smoke. Um, and so those are um, duck livers cooking at the table on the uh, everlasting charcoal um, that can then come from the table into the dishwasher, back in the oven, and get reused and reused and reused, and it never burns away. Okay. so. Uh, that's at the bottom of the pit there, that's Jack Algiers. He's the head farmer at Stone Barns. Um, he dug this pit on the vegetable farm to analyze soil stratification and root penetration and growth. I thought this would be a good idea to take some of the clay that was well beneath the soil and make something of it. So um, pretty much immediately following the conversation I had with the chef, about trying to reinvent a charger for his restaurant. They, they hadn't used chargers. Um, but the beginning of a meal at Blue Hill at Stone Barns is a rapid succession of small dishes, maybe 20 of them. And they all come out on, um, I should say, there's no menu. It's just um, you sit and you eat. And you just get more and more food. Um, so it's, it's a little atypical as restaurants go. Um, and there could be up to 30, sometimes 40 courses in the night. But a course might be one bite. Um, in, so early on, um, all the dishes come out in, on smaller objects, smaller plates and bowls. Uh, and the, uh, the charger then um, would be the ground for that succession of dishes. And so I thought it could literally be the ground. So we dug um, some clay from about six, seven feet under the soil. Really had to go down to find the clay. Um, and then I took it to the studio and I didn't alter it. I just manipulated it. I wanted it to be um, pure, just the material. Um, it, one of those courses you may get might be a single mokum carrot, which is a, a really delicious carrot, unaltered, picked and, and served. So I wanted this to be similar in that it's unaltered, right? Dug um, and then fired. Um, and so I didn't take anything out, I didn't put anything in, and each charger then is a physical manifestation of that um, local soil. It's, uh, it's got some clay in it, but it's not very clay. Um, so the next piece is a bread plate. Um, if you know the story of uh, Dan's, Dan's narrative with food, uh, bread is really important. Um, on the farm, they grow uh, several varieties of wheat in the fields. There's emmer wheat, 
uh, several very old wheat varieties, but none of them really were good enough. So um, Dan has developed over a number of years his own wheat called barber wheat. And so you see on the bottom left of the plate, that's a little barber wheat. It looks a little different than the emmer wheat, which is the taller one, and I think einkorn wheat as well. And then there's rye and grass. There are other plants that grow in the field. It's not a monoculture, so I wanted to represent those other plants as well on the plate. They're in expression, not in impression, because when it comes to the table, um, you, when you eat there, you learn a lot. And uh, with bread, bread is almost always a course. Um, and bread and butter, which I could pretty much eat every day, um, is always one of my favorite courses there. Um, and so as, as you learn about the wheat, um, I want something tactile to actually inform you further about something about the plant from which the, that wheat flour came. This is how it would look in service. Um, the, uh, that bread right there is 100% barber wheat bread. I also, I have a background in geology, so I'm interested in fossils and the way they form. And if you think about fossils, um, one can learn uh, a lot from an impression, but um, maybe more from an expression, uh, in that uh, it's expressing itself uh, three-dimensionally, you can touch it, um, you're not looking at what it did or what impression it made, you're looking at the physical thing and touching it. So in the background there, uh, is a little smear of butter. Um, this butter is not your usual butter. It is called single utter butter. And at Blue, Blue Hill Farm, they separate um, the milking of their cows. They keep separate, so they don't mix it all together, so that each cow creates its own butter, um, single utter butter. And uh, one of the courses is a butter tasting, where you get to taste to tell you the name of the cow. Daisy is the one I remember being the best. Um, uh, because Daisy liked to eat over by the clover patch, and it tasted like clover. Whereas another cow maybe liked to eat somewhere else on the farm, and it tasted of that. And you can really taste it. Um, so I thought, what's the material analog to that? Right? So if single utter butter is this sort of uh, hyper um, specificity and locality in ingredient, what does the ceramic version look like? So um, every time I walked the farm, I noticed there were stones everywhere, um, and that the farmers would dig them up and create a pile to get them out of the way, because you can't till a farm with too many rocks. And the pile, to me, looked like uh, it was right for something. So I grabbed this rock, and I fired it, and I crushed it, and then pulverized it. Ball milled it. So in the bottom right there, you see um, the rock. Un un um, no ingredients added, nothing removed, just processed, right? Like a lot of the food at the restaurant. Nothing adding, nothing removed, just processed in the kitchen. Um, and then sprayed that single stone onto a stoneware plate. So I was thinking of this image I took and how each one of those rocks is its own glaze. Like each one of the cows made its own butter. Um, and um, so there again is that, is that narrative I keep coming back to is um, the parallel between ingredients and materials, um, the idea of highlighting locality and um, specificity of place, right? Because that rock creates this glaze. And after I glazed, maybe I think I got 150, 160 plates glazed, the rock was done, right? And that's it. It's no longer. It only exists now as a glaze on those plates. The texture of the plate I wanted to look like, I'll go back if I can. I can't, but you remember. Look like the surface of the soil, oh, I did, right? And so that's the plate there, this is from overhead, and this is it in service. Eggplant cooked in turmeric leaf. Okay, the next one took a little more doing. Um, 
I, I, that, that's the chef and the farmer and me. Um, so Jack Algiers on the right, Dan Barber on the left, and I'm explaining to them the idea that I wanted to um, cast the surface of the vegetable farm. I wanted to literally take the farm and bring it to the table. And so for this, I made a mold of the surface of the farm. This was right after um, a night of rain. Uh, it was a freshly tilled row that was laying fallow for the winter. This was this past fall. Um, in a piece that eventually I call Casting the Farm, there's the mold. Here we are demolding or cleaning it. And this is the piece. So the surface, you can see that little thumb-like thing. That's an eggplant that's rotting. Um, this was the row that grew eggplants and peppers. Excuse me. Um, what I wanted to do with this object, this plate, is um, to tell a story about the natural processes on the farm, how we interact with the surface of the soil, um, and how that leads to sustenance, and the practice of farming brought to the table so that when the vegetables eventually get served on these plates, they're reuniting with their origin. So what if I carry this over to the animals? Um, the, the, the surface of the soil, the surface of the farm where the animals eat is an incredibly dynamic place, right? It's the place where um, rocks become soil, where soil becomes plant, you know, through the roots, where plant becomes animal through the process of pecking, grazing, and rooting, and where eventually animal becomes us through the process of us eating, right? So I wanted to see what that surface would look like and if I could capture that process. Um, these are Toulouse geese at the Stone Barn Center for Food and Ag Agriculture really big geese. Um, so for this, if you look at the, uh, the plate that the, the goose is standing on, that's a wet clay plate that I prepared and embedded um, stuff geese really like to eat. And they eat through the process of pecking. Um, and uh, if you've read the book, The Third Plate, you, you probably know that geese's favorite thing to eat are acorns. So we embedded a few acorns in there as well. We did it with the tuna sheep at Stone Barns. So for this one in the studio, you can see the plate at the bottom. Um, I grew grass in a clay plate. And um, this was late fall, a few years ago, um, where the, the sheep were like, what the hell is this? We don't have green grass. So it took them a little while, but eventually they, they got there and um, nibbled on the grass. They grazed a little bit. Um, the, uh, these guys, the geese, were also super skeptical. They're like, what is he doing? Uh, but eventually, this one in particular really pecked a lot at it. Um, and then the Berkshire pigs, they didn't need any coaxing. So <laughs> thankfully, we prepared two of these plates because the first one, they ate. <laughs> Just totally ate, right? And they're behind an electric fence. Um, uh, and so the second one, um, don't touch electric fences. The second one, I don't remember. Uh, we, get, we slid it under the fence. They started, and my elbow hit the fence. And then Arnold, thankfully, who was helping me out from the farm, grabbed it before they destroyed it. Um, and I'll show you what that looks like in a little bit. And so I took those back to the studio and made molds of them in plaster. Uh, in the foreground is the, the um, pigs, and then geese, and then sheep press the black porcelain I, I developed for the chef's plates. I use that to press some plates. This is, this is, this is the goose plate, oh, um, pecking, the pecking plate. Um, so the idea here is for that, is so that the plate really is a physical representation of that transmutation of matter from stone to soil to um, vegetable or plant to uh, animal through the eating process. And then that circle is connected when it's used. So this is the pecking plate with fried chicken's feet coated with powdered pig's blood. 
super good. Um, the, uh, the grazing plate, um, so all those little dots are roots. Oh, I better hurry. Um, sheep's milk, cheese, a carbonized bone, those black things, that's going to come back. Remember those bones and how black they are. And then um, the rooting plate. This is it in service, and he serves, Dan serves a tart filled with everything a pig forages for in the forest around stone barns, but prepared, mostly through pickling, for human consumption. Okay, so these are the three that tell that story, pecking, grazing, rooting. Um, I, I want to get to my last piece um, now, but I, I want to share a very quick anec anecdote. The, um, the bones uh, that they use to cook on, they carbonize their bones, turn it in, into charcoal, and then cook, all, cook on them. Nothing gets wasted in the restaurant. Um, and so I took these bones back to the studio, and I thought they would be great as a carbon source in a sagger. Put a plate in the sagger, put the bones in there, fired it, the plate was terrible. Um, but at the bottom of the sagger, um, these are some raw bones were these, fired bones. And they were so white. And it, it, stood in my, it sat in my studio for like, I was like three or four months. And I didn't throw them out because I knew they were something, but I didn't know quite what that was. Here's a picture of before firing the bones, after. Um, and it was in the kitchen talking to Dan, um, holding a piece of porcelain and looking at these fired bones that it was like, you know, like, aha. Um, so obvious that bones give you bone china. Duh. Um, so, rushed back to the studio, got a recipe for bone china, never worked with bone china before, started um, weighing, grinding, mixing. This was the resultant paste. And the picture doesn't do it justice. It was so white. I've been trying to figure out a um, a way to describe it. The best way I can describe this bone china paste was that it was neon white. It was the whitest thing I'd ever seen in my studio. It made porcelain look dark. And so I dried it up, made some bone china using Josiah Spode the first, Josiah Spode the second, original 1799 bone china recipe. And the resultant bowl was this. Um, a bone china bowl made from the bones uh, of waste bones of the restaurant to be then used by the restaurant to serve the animals from which the bones came. It looks terribly lonely up here, and um, that's because that's not its natural environment. This is like looking at an animal in a zoo. Now it's in nature. Um, this is in the kitchen um, being plated, um, and it, it's where this bone china really shines. It's incredibly white. It's more durable than any other material that I've ever been able to develop. It's the one pot they've yet to break. Now, that is in part because of its durability, but also because it's thin and white and they probably handle it differently. Um, it doesn't scratch, it doesn't stain. Um, and so that got me to thinking, why is this bone china so good? Is it because the bones were so good? Do grass-fed animals make better bones than grain-fed? or then contained animal food lot animals? Um, is there a connection between how we raise our animals and the aesthetics of a historical craft material? So I tested it. On the left, same recipe, same kiln, same everything. On the left is bone china made using Blue Hill bones. On the right is bone china made using industrially sourced bones. And I mean, it was like dramatic, holy cow. Right, blobby, gray, yellowish, ugly, industrial bones. Doesn't it look sad? And on the left, happy bones. Happy bones, sad bones, we call them. <laughs> that led to a study that we're currently doing. Uh, we, a colleague of mine in biology uh, and another one in forensic chemistry, are now studying the effects of farming practices and animal husbandry on the material properties of bone china to figure out if this hypothesis is actually true. <laughs> okay, 
I could watch this all day. What you're looking at are cows frolicking, right? They are let out of the barn after a winter of eating hay to um, be let out on fresh grass for the first time. They look pretty happy. Um, and so this tells us a few things. One, cows like to eat grass. <laughs> Two, when they're allowed out to eat grass, they move around a lot. And both of those things lead to bone density. Grass in the diet, exercise. Does this bone density then translate into higher quality bone china? So we are collecting femurs from happy cows, from grain-fed cows, which are, we're learning are kind of happy, and from sad cows, um, the ones that don't get to move and get hormones and antibiotics, hormones that lead to rapid growth and less density of bones, um, grain versus grass, and we're testing all of these to um, see if we can prove something. At Arcadia, we have a, a really good forensic science lab that has some equipment that, um, uh, available to us for this study, but not all of it. And so just earlier this week, just on Tuesday, I sent my two research assistants up to Alfred to work with Dr. Bill Cardi. Um, and I'm gonna show you just a few more images because I think we'll have a moment for questions if there are any. Um, this, we just got three days ago, so I don't know what it means yet, um, but it's cool. These are, <laughs> what's that say, grass-fed? This is the grass-fed scanning electron microscopic image of grass-fed bone china, grain-fed bone china, industrial bone china, right? All the tests are proving that the industrial stuff is weaker. It's not just uglier, it's weaker too. Um, so we have to analyze all this data, and um, the data will lead us, excuse me, will lead us where it leads us, right? Um, as much as I hope to make certain connections, that doesn't matter to science. You just go where the data leads you. Um, and then I'm gonna leave you on this slide. I haven't yet, we haven't yet dug into this because it's only three days old. At the top are x-ray diffraction charts of the three bones, grass-fed, grain-fed, sad bones, industrial bones. Um, and we notice, I circled it, this odd mineral called Whitlockite that's only present in the industrial bones. Now, so we looked it up, um, and it occurs in nature, rarely, geologically, but it also occurs biologically. And um, there's, a, there's a likelihood that it's happening due to processing, the way the factory manufactures bone china versus the way we do. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a conclusion there, maybe a little less sexy than the one that is also possible, and that is Whitlockite is only found in animal bones um, due to bone disease. So there could be a connection between um, the way we treat the animals, bone disease, and then qualities of bone china. So we'll see, I, we haven't proven it yet, uh, we have to analyze this and do more studies, but it's pretty exciting. And it's all I'm thinking about because it's the stuff that just came back. So I wanted to end on there. <laughs> um, that's it.